I request that you should be here for tomorrow as well because this talk, uh, we have a section on OSCE. So OSCE is like a melange of spotter, scar, anjo, anything can come, OCD findings, iris. So ma'am will be discussing one part of it uh, and the rest of the spotters will come in another section in the afternoon and then one more in the evening at 5.
tricuspid valve down and the systolic descent of the base of the heart causes the X prime descent. So that is the dominant descent in the right atrium. And then you have the T wave where the diastole starts. So we have the side film of the uh, atrium, the V wave forms. And then you have the Y descent where the AV valves open and it uh, flows into the ventricle. So in diastole you have the Y descent and the in diastole you have the atrial wave which is the A wave which is a positive wave and the X descent is primarily a systolic descent. Here is it's a schematic diagram. Here is a recorded uh, waveform. You see that basically the X prime descent is more prominent than the Y descent in the right atrium. And another very important characteristic of a right atrial pressure recording is the respiratory radiation. All of us know during deep inspiration the RA mean pressure will fall. And you look at the scale factor here, and it should come back in inspiration. This is very classical for the right atrial recording. When, when, when there are conditions like in constrictive pericarditis where the during deep inspiration the fall in the intrathoracic pressure is not transmitted into the right atrium which causes the fall in the RA mean pressure. So you actually have, instead of a fall you can actually have a rise in the RA mean pressure during deep inspiration. This is called as a small sign which is very classical in constrictive pericarditis. Basically it's a restrictive physiology. Uh, the same thing it gives is a concept of pericarditis. If you have a typical uh, M pattern has been uh, described, it gives it gives a both X descent and the Y descent, which is very prominent. This M pattern it is uh, uh, it is it is it comes to the right atrial waveform mainly because of the very prominent uh, Y descent, which is very steep and the trough is uh, very low. You can see the right atrial mean pressure is elevated to 20 millimeters. In constrictive pericarditis, all the diastolic pressures in the LV, RV, and the right atrium and left atrium are all equally elevated. And you have the classical M pattern, which is mainly because of the prominent uh, Y descent, which is very deep and rapid. Uh, in, uh, this happens mainly in constrictive pericarditis because of the y, during the early diastolic uh, filling phase, that is a rapid filling phase of the ventricle. There is still blood flowing into the ventricle from the atrium, so you have the Y descent which is preserved. Whereas in the tamponade, if you go to a case of tamponade where there is a, the whole heart is boxed inside, all the four chambers are boxed inside free fluid in the pericardial space which is just compressing on the heart in all the phases of the cardiac cycle. So actually the Y descent, the diastolic restriction to filling is uh, total, that is it, it is throughout the diastole starting from the early rapid filling phase up to the end of diastole. So you don't have the Y descent, you cannot see the Y descent in a right atrial pressure recording in a, whenever there is a tamponade. And once you do pericardial synthesis, see this is the patient with tamponade where the RA pressure is very high, there is also a catheter in the pericardium which is also equally high. And after when you're doing pericardial synthesis, you can see actually see the Y descent coming back. Double descent is seen and the Y descent becomes prominent. So when you see a clinically, when you see a Y descent in the jugular in a patient sitting across, then you know the patient is not in tamponade. That in tamponade, the Y descent will disappear. And in patients with uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation, you can have a very tall V wave followed by a Y descent. It can be a single V on Y descent. Without X, it can, come, it can come on to the X descent and make it like a positive V wave followed by a Y descent. The V wave can be so high that it can, uh, when you record it in the right atrium, it can appear like a right ventricular pressure trace actually. So here is a simultaneous right atrial and right ventricular uh, pressure trace. In uh, You can see the uh, right ventricular shape of the right ventricular pressure trace and the atrial pressure trace almost looks like a ventricle. Almost it's like ventricularization of the atrial pressure wave. And in diastole, you can see there is a small gradient between right atrium and uh, right ventricle. So that suggests that there is some tricuspid stenosis. Actually in tricuspid stenosis, even a, a, a gradient between RA and RB of 1 to 2, 2 to 3 millimeters is also significant. There shouldn't be any gradient. When you put a, chair, when you put a sheet in the femoral vein, in a patient with severe tricuspid regurgitation, the same V wave gets transmitted to the femoral vein. So you can actually, it looks like an arterial pressure trace. So it also looks uh, the same large V wave. Uh, the regurgitation occurs into the atrium and then it's transmitted to the femoral vein. So it gives an appearance like an artery. 
and you always, when you record a rate pressure wave, you, you correlate it with a ECG. The rhythm is very important. When you have a sinus rhythm, P wave followed by a QRS, following a P wave, you have the A wave and the X descent, and then the Y descent comes after the V wave. But whenever there is A V dissociation, this half of the ECG, you see there is A V dissociation. So you have a very giant uh, wave. The atria is trying to contract against a closed tricuspid valve. So you have a very giant uh, A wave which is called as a cannon wave, which is very typical of A V dissociation. Uh, the same phenomenon happens when you when you pace the ventricle. When this right side of the trace, you can see the patient is in sinus rhythm. You have a nice small A wave followed by X descent, V and Y descent. Whereas when you pace the ventricle, there is A V dissociation. So, and the, again, the atria is contracting against a closed tricuspid valve, and you have a giant cannon wave. So you have to correlate it with the ECG, look at the scale on the left side, and then interpret the look at the waveform, understand the waveform, and then interpret the changes. When you move on to the left atrium, uh, it is also the same. The right atrium, left atrium pressure phase is also the same. Like you have X descent and the Y descent and the A wave and the V wave. Only thing the left atrium is less compliant than the right atrium. So you have the Y descent which is more. The left atrium is in continuity with the left ventricle which is also a stiffer ventricle than the right ventricle. So you have the B and Y descent which is more prominent than the X descent. And you can see the LA pressure. Normal LA pressure is around, uh, uh, LA mean is around uh, 10 to 12, like in LV, le left ventricular diastolic pressure, unlike the right atrium. So, the, if you put a catheter in the pulmonary capillary wedge position, and for the practical purposes, you cannot enter the LA in all cases to record the left atrial pressure to understand uh, what is happening. Only when you do a transeptal puncture during procedures, you can see it. So, for practical purposes in uh, cath lab, when you put a catheter in the pulmonary capillary wedge position, you are recording the left atrial pressure. Again, it is the X descent and the Y descent. The Y descent is more prominent than the X descent on the left atrial side. You can only see that there is a small uh, phase lag between the left atrial pressure trace and the pulmonary capillary wedge, which is about 100 milliseconds. So, except for that, the mean pressures are all exactly comparable. So, you can use it for the LA pressure. So, to compare between the left atrium and the right atrium, you can see the scale. The RA mean pressure is up to 4 to 5, and whereas the left atrial mean pressure is slightly higher, around 10. And you can see the dominance, the X prime descent is more prominent than the Y descent, whereas the left atrium is less compliant to have a Y descent which is slightly more prominent than the X descent. Move on to the ventricles. Um, in the left ventricle, the, in the diastole, you have the early rapid, this is the diastolic phase, here is the systole. So you have the early, in early diastole, there is the rapid filling, which occurs from the very low, uh, zero pressure, it comes up very rapidly in the early diastole. And then the pressure, the volume increases, but the pressure doesn't go up, there is diastasis. And then the peak wave comes and the atria contracts and then contributes the atrial peak filling to the left ventricle at the end of diastole. And then you have the end diastolic pressure point. In patients with uh, uh, filling re restriction to ventricular filling, as in typical conditions like constrictor pericarditis and in tamponade, and also to some extent in restricted cardiomyopathy and heart failure, you have this kind of various filling patterns in uh, diastole, uh, in the right ventricle and the left ventricle. You, uh, the first three lines, this number one, these two, three lines are all uh, early stages of uh, constriction or uh, heart failure where only the, in end diastole the pressures are elevated. But in the line 3, you can see there is a typical early, the only the rapid filling phase in the first of the third of diastole is preserved. After that, the pressure plateaus off. This is the third number 3. So that is typical constrictive pressure like this, to have the dip and the plateau. Whereas in Tampara, it is a 4 and 5 in 5. There is no there is no filling at all in diastole. It doesn't allow any filling into the left ventricle, even starting from the first beginning of uh, diastole. So that is the, so the typical word is the total diastolic uh, restriction to filling in Tampara. Also in constriction, a constrictive pericarditis and in restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is also a restrictive physiology, similar physiology, 
you have uh, the diastolic pressure. This is a simultaneous recording of LV and RV. Look at the diastolic portion. You have the early diastolic filling is uh, preserved. That is very classical of uh, constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. You have a critical dip in the, this corresponds to the white descent. The early diastolic filling is preserved and then the pressure plateaus off. There is a slight elevation and then it plateaus off. There is no, the volume is slight filling is occurring but there is no increase in the pressures. And the, the diastolic pressure itself is elevated. So it is equalization of the both LV and RV diastolic pressures with the typical different plateau appearance uh, in uh, constrictive pericarditis and restricted cardiomyopathy. So that is well appreciated in this uh, trace, better than the uh, previous trace, where you can see following an ectopic B, you have a long uh, diastole filling period. So you can appreciate the typical dip and the plateau appearance in the first third of uh, diastole in both the ventricles, both LV and RV. And then we move on to the great arteries. Uh, you have the uh, typically you have seen this uh, trace every day in uh, cath lab. This is the, you have the peak systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. The difference between the systolic and diastolic, the pulse pressure. And you have, this is the uh, anachronic limb of the aortic pulse pressure. And then the plateau, anachronic shoulder. And then you have the diachronic limb or the descending limb of the aortic uh, waveform. Where it is interrupted by a diachronic notch which corresponds to the uh, A2 valve closure on either side, left and the right, it is the A2 and the P2, the incisura or the diacrotic notch in the diacrotic limb. And then following that is the diastolic portion of the aortic pressure waveform. So it depends on uh, various factors influence the where this diacrotic notch will occur on the diacrotic uh, limb, depending on the peripheral vascular resistance, stiffness, um, uh, and other factors. So well, viscosity, a lot of other things. So the diacrotic, the position of the diacrotic notch will vary and also the volume status of the individual also will uh, influence the waveform. The central aortic pressure as it is measured in the cat lab, it is like this. You should, we should understand that it is a summation of both the forward pressure wave and the reflected pressure wave from the uh, branch points for the vascular tree. The main uh, uh, point from where the reflected waves come in the central aortic is the bifurcation of the terminal aorta into the iliac arteries. The reflected waves come and then it uh, summates with the uh, forward pressure wave and then you get what, what you record in the cat lab as a central aortic waveform. You can see the difference between this forward and the uh, what you measured in the uh, cat lab is the peaking, the late systolic peaking is occurring and then the diacrotic notch. So this peaking occurs mainly because of the addition of the reflected wave to the forward wave. Uh, this is a typical uh, the patient with a hypovolemic uh, shock. You can see even when there is a blood loss in the cat lab or uh, you can see that suddenly the pressure drops. Both the systolic pressure, the diastolic, the pulse pressure, everything comes down. And then the typical characteristic waveform in hypovolemia is you can recognize even in the bedside uh, ICU in post-op cases, the diacrotic notch will occur very low in the diacrotic limb. And then the diastolic portion following the diacrotic notch will be very slow and low. So that is very typical of hypovolemia. Following you give a fluid bolus of 200, 300 ml of fluid and then the pressure waveform changes like the systolic pressure comes up the pulse pressure becomes normal and then the diacrotic notch moves up from as low as here to above. So then you can identify looking at this that the patient is in hypovolemia. And uh, pulses paradoxes, this you have seen in patients with uh, tamponade, there is a systolic uh, variation of the systolic pressure as it is being recorded, the, uh, there is hardly any, usually there is normally in normal patients there is a, uh, during deep inspiration there is a fall of about 5 to 10, 10 millimeters which is not easily, easily perceptible in the clinical examination but uh, in patients with uh, tamponade the same uh, fall gets exaggerated to more than 15 to 20, 20 millimeters during deep inspiration there is a fall which is, which is an exaggeration of uh, normal 
Why it is called as paradoxes is during deep inspiration wakes, the venous return is more so we expect the stroke volume to increase the systolic pressure. But in uh, tamponade, there is no filling occurring throughout diastole. So the variation is not, during deep inspiration it is not transmitted. After pericardial synthesis, the tamponade disappears and then you have the normal phreatic pressures. And in patients with uh, severe elbow dysfunction and heart failure, you can uh, see the rhythm is uh, sinus rhythm. There is no variation in the rhythm like a varying cycle interval like atrial fibrillation or anything. But you can see the pressure is alternating. That is beat to beat variation in the uh, stroke volume is responsible for this uh, fall and uh, increase in the pressure with every other beat. Various mechanisms have been proposed for that. The myocyte theory and uh, transtarling work are all coming into play. You can know the theory behind it. And the other thing you see in the lab routinely is when you put a temporary pacemaker and you pace the ventricle, again you have AV dissociation. See this half of the tracing, the patient is in sinus rhythm and you have the good systolic uh, pressure. But when you put the temporary pacemaker and start pacing the ventricle, there is AV dissociation. So there is loss of atrial heat and filling to the ventricle. So the end diastolic volume is reduced, so the stroke volume is reduced and you have fall in the uh, blood pressure. So we move on to the pulmonary artery pressure trace. It is just like aortic pressure trace except that there is a phasic variation in the PA trace compared to the iota. Uh, this is a patient where the, uh, there is an acute severe MR has uh, developed uh, in a patient during a procedure and you have this, this half is the pulmonary capillary wedge trace and here is a pulmonary arterial pressure trace and you can see there is a very tall uh, peak V wave which is transmitted directly to the uh, PA because the left atrium is small and non-compliant and suddenly we have produced uh, MR in a stenotic lesion and the V wave gets transmitted to the PA directly producing an artifact on the uh, dichrotic limb of the PA pressure trace. Very rare phenomenon. So like uh, Dr. Kiran was mentioning also you need to know, have, uh, know some technical aspects. When you put in a pigtail in the left ventricle and record the pressure, when you pull back to record the, or to record the simultaneous pressure and take the gradient for right stenosis, the pigtails have to be deeply inside the LV to record a proper trace. Otherwise, if some of the pig, pig, uh, holes in the side holes in the pigtail are lying in the iota and some in the LV, you can get a hybrid uh, picture like this. So you may actually, uh, it can be misleading and you can have a falsely low gradient. Uh, you may think the right stenosis is not significant, so you should know the uh, technical aspects of uh, recording. This is the same thing. Here I have shown the catheter. Here looking at the trace, you know here is the LV trace. Here is the femoral artery, so you have a good gradient showing that is significant iotic stenosis. But here the iotic stenosis looks like it is not severe, but it's actually the same patient. It looks falsely low because the catheter is lying like this. That you can identify from looking at the trace because the diastolic portion of the left ventricular pressure trace doesn't look like this. You don't have the early diastolic pressure which is higher than the end diastolic pressure. Actually, the early diastolic pressure I showed you in the previous frames should dip down like this in early diastole and then it should come up and the end diastolic pressure will be the highest. So, but here it is reverse, it is going down like this from a higher pressure so you know the trace is not alright and there is a problem in recording. Uh, similar thing, you pull, pulling back the catheter from the left ventricle into the iota, you can see in between there is a, these, these uh, traces this is uh, falsely showing a very wide pulse pressure. Like the systolic pressure is here and the diastolic is very low. So it may, uh, you may think there is some runoff is there and conditions, such con conditions should be entertained. But it's actually because some of the pigtails, some of the cytomers are lying wrongly and you pull back properly into the iota, this is the normal pressure trace in the same patient. patient. So you should remember the technical aspects when you record the pressure. This is also some uh, loose connection in the catheter to the uh, transducer. You can see the LV pressure and simultaneous iotic pressure. Iotic pressure is remaining uh, same, but slowly as you watch, the LV pressure is uh, coming down. There is no condition like this where the iotic pressure is good and then the 
will be pressure is uh, low. So you know the particular transducer that's connected is uh, loose. So these are the, some basic things. Then we will move on to some interactive session and I will show you some uh, traits. Can you just try to make a diagnosis or interpret rather? It will be nice if someone takes it up singly rather than a chorus, please. It's okay if anybody is wrong, please. No, it doesn't matter. Just make an attempt to interpret what is shown. Just say which are the chambers. Uh, just describe uh, whatever uh, was uh, taught now. <laughs> Try to interpret it. Any takers? The scale is here. Anybody? Yeah, anyone? One here, one on this side, and one here. Acute day, I guess. Which is acute day? Acute day, Pressure and that is 
that occurs much higher than the pulmonary valve, uh, mitral valve closure, which occurs very early. You can appreciate this on the echo also. What clinical finding will you not find in this patient? What clinical finding will you not expect in that patient? It's asked very commonly. Is that all, sir? Sir would ask. White pulse pressure and diastolic run of signs will not be. That's been told already. Anything else? That's been told. Anything else in the sounds? Because you already have a closure, right? It will get more than one. Anybody else? This one. This side will be the one. They're all the other one. Okay, what, does, uh, what are the gradients uh, mentioned here? Can you interpret this, yeah, sir? Uh, three gradients are shown. One is three to three gradients. Yes. Another one is three to three gradients. Yes. And this mean gradient, which is area level. Okay. So, which is, this is the uh, mean gradient. This is what? That's the mean gradient. Peak instantaneous. This is P2. Peak. Very good. See, the mean, the peak instantaneous uh, gradient which is between the peak of the LV systolic pressure and you drop a perpendicular to meet the aortic pressure waveform, that is the peak instantaneous gradient. And the peak to peak gradient is between the peak of the left ventricle and the peak of the aortic uh, pressure waveform. And this you can appreciate that the uh, peak, aortic, uh, uh, peak of the aortic pressure occurs much later in systole in severe aortic stenosis. And so this gradient is different from peak to peak gradient. And the mean gradient is you uh, trace the area between the LV and the aorta and then divide by the ejection systolic ejection period. Then you get the mean gradient. If you compare it, why you should know this is we always mentally we do an echo and then take a patient to the cath lab. We do record gradients in the echo lab which where we record as a peak gradient and the mean gradient. But uh, the recording, the peak gradient which you record in the echo lab is what what, are the, what formula do we use to get the peak gradient in the echo lab? 4 v squared. So here is the echo gradient which is uh, shown below. So this matches with the peak instantaneous gradient. So what we measure as peak gradient in the echo lab is the peak instantaneous gradient across the aortic valve, which, which is from here to when you drop a perpendicular to meet the aorta, this is the peak instantaneous gradient. So these both are comparable and not the peak to peak gradient or even the pullback gradient which you get in the cat lab is not comparable to this gradient that we should know. So it is better to talk in terms of mean gradient when you compare the gradients between the echo lab and the cat lab which is more, will be more meaningful. Though instantaneous is much more uh, correct actually because simultaneously you are recording the gradient. Uh, this is, uh, can anybody interpret this trace? Yes, come on. Please, please stand up. Give the mic here. Doesn't that make the wrong? Please stand up. Simultaneous. 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 It's a simultaneous pressure tracing from LV and uh, LV to thermo have been pulled back. Uh, it shows uh, as the cathedral is pulled back from the LV to the femoral artery, there is a drop in femoral artery pressure, suggest of critical aortic stenosis, not a drop. Once you pull back the catheter, the femoral artery pressure is not dropping. No, but yes. There is an increase in systolic pressure. Now, once the uh, obstruction is really very severe. Yes, excellent. That's called the catheter It's not false, it is increase in the femoral artery pressure. You put a catheter across the left ventricle in critical, it happens only in critical aortic stenosis where the valve area is very less, like less than 0.6 cm squared and the, for the increase in the gradient is usually in the range of 15 to 20. You can see the uh, femoral artery pressure is here. Once the occlusion is removed by pulling out the catheter from the left ventricle, the femoral artery pressure jumps, jumps up and you have a gradient of about 20 mm increase in the gradient, increase in the pressure. So good, let us... Uh, can you...
we proceed that we have a lot of more space, so we can have keep it for tomorrow. Sure. We can finish that. Issue. Doctor is gone. Yeah. We can do it tomorrow. The rest of the day. Okay. Yeah.